afternoon. Good morning. Or, <laughs> morning. Um, welcome back for those that were able to join us for the keynote. Uh, once again, I'm Josh Ball. I'm the Delta Omega president. Um, and we're excited to have a panel here with a group of experts from around the community on the opioid epidemic. So um, I would like to introduce our moderator, Allison Sampson. She is uh, the media chief media relations officer at um, the Academic Health Center. Take it away, Allison. I'll clarify and say I'm not the chief, but that's all right. I'm flattered that you think so. I do work with a team of about four or five other public information officers, so we represent all the health-related colleges on our side of campus, and then we also have a, a team under university relations that represents the other side of campus. Um, my areas, my main areas are covering the neurosciences, public health and environmental health, so I always love the chance to be a part of this program. I know um, two years ago you all fo focused on global health. Last year was refugee health and this year is appropriately um, the opioid crisis. So I'm glad to be a part of this panel. And we have a great lineup of experts. Um, some are UC experts, some are former UC experts. Um, so I will go ahead and kick it off by letting you each go down the line. Introduce yourselves if you give us your name, uh, title, and affiliation, and then just a little bit about kind of how you're involved or connected to um, opioid issues. So we'll start with you, Dr. Lyons. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, my name is Mike Lyons. I'm on the faculty of the Department of Emergency Medicine at UC. I uh, am a practicing emergency physician, uh, but my main job is as a health services researcher. Uh, and I focus on issues of how the emergency department can monitor and impact health, uh, implementation of prevention interventions in the ED, and how to reduce fragmentation between emergency care and the rest of health care, and also fragmentation between emergency care and public health. So, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Ingram, and I'm the health commissioner with Hamilton County Public Health, and I also have the, uh, the pleasure and the privilege to uh, teach a, sem uh, a semester here at the School of Public Health, at the Public Health Program, as an adjunct instructor. Um, I became involved with the opiate epidemic um, primarily out of necessity <clears throat> back in um, 2015, actually 2014, when the Scotts County, Indiana uh, HIV outbreak occurred that you may, I'm sure many of you have read the studies on it, and um, uh, when a small community in Austin, Indiana, just outside of the Louisville, Kentucky uh, market, uh, media market, um, became um, uh, through to a, a single source uh, sharing of, uh, of equipment among people that were crushing a pharmaceutical, uh, <clears throat> pharmaceutical grade um, medication known as Opana um, and started spreading HIV. And by the time um, the uh, situation became, got in check, it went from um, a few cases to 180 cases in a town of 4,200 people. So those of you that uh, like to calculate rates can calculate the rates and understand how, how serious that is. Um, so uh, our role has become one of, uh, of uh, overdose surveillance to assist folks like Chief Sinan, uh, the medical community, and so forth. Um, where are the overdoses occurring, um, and what are the hot spots in Hamilton County? And I'm going to show some data in that in a minute. Second of all is in harm reduction. So obviously, as you know, when, uh, when something becomes the leading cause of death of folks under the age of 55, like opiates has become in this, in this community as well as pretty much across this country, um, that should get the attention of the, uh, of the health director, health commissioner, health officer. Of course, it uh, has. So we're also concerned about the secondary spread of bloodborne infections among the IV drug using population um, and also trying to uh, open up other portals for those to get into treatment. And finally, um, we're also kind of trying to understand uh, what systems are working or not working relative to, uh, uh, to folks that have um, died due to overdoses. We began a, an overdose fatality team. If any of you are, rem uh, re are familiar with child fatality review teams, which has been in existence for decades, um, that's still, that still go on today, we actually do a deep dive into the folks that have um, died of overdoses to understand where the, are the systems um, issues. Because at the end of the day, um, generally, it's not, uh, it is, obviously, it's all about people, but it's really the systems that end up failing. And so we want to uh, understand a little bit more of that. So that just started, and that is a, a program that uh, we work with with the coroner's office. 
and our good friends from the Cincinnati Health Department. <laughs> Thanks, Commissioner. Um, I'm Jenny Mooney. I'm the Division Director for Family Health Services at the Cincinnati Health Department. Um, I kind of consider myself sort of a jack of all trades. I'm a sociologist, um, criminologist, if you will. I very rarely get to wear my criminologist hat, so I'm a little excited to be able to talk a little bit about how I see that through that lens today, um, through this, ep this epidemic through that lens today. But I guess originally um, my interest and involvement in this started really, frankly, in 2002 with OxyContin and Appalachia and the hollers of Eastern Kentucky. Um, I did grunt work on a research team initially and tracked 2,000 people over, over two years for longitudinal research, um, social science, behavioral science research. And um, I can't believe they sent me out there by myself to do it, but I did. And I drove my car with a map before technology existed. And I drove into the middle of nowhere, and I could literally, by the end of doing that first study, um, I could profile. I could, I could tell what people's drug of choice were before I even met them. Just give me a few demographic characteristics. And I really saw this sort of unfold um, with, um, frankly, poor white folks, Appalachian folks in eastern Kentucky um, who were, frankly, part of the whole pill mill structure, if you're familiar. And, and then it evolved into... Um, something obviously that we're dealing with right now but um, as a Kentucky native it was fascinating watching the drug trends so the western side of the state was um, sort of inundated with methamphetamine um, the eastern side was pretty much Oxycontin and, and any other kind of pain pills um, and then the urban core which was where I lived and worked was largely crack cocaine or powder cocaine so it was interesting to see those map across geography and how things shifted and changed just based on the physical layout of where you live um, so that's kind of where I started um, I stayed in research for 10 years and then um, my folks would call me a trader but I moved into the public health world because I wanted to have more of a direct impact in the community Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Brown. Thanks for inviting me here today. I'm a faculty member in the psychiatry department. I work in addiction sciences here at UC in the College of Medicine. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist and public health person by training. Um, I provide clinical psychology services within our addiction sciences division clinics. We have outpatient and intensive outpatient treatment services. Um, so I wear that hat um, a, a bit of my time. Um, but I'm also a researcher um, who's really interested in how we can develop interventions to better link patients to substance use treatment and also the intersection with infectious disease, so HIV, hepatitis C, um, and really glad to be here today. Uh, Tom Sinan, I talked earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Sean Ryan. I'm a dual board certified in emergency and in addiction medicine. I uh, did my original emergency training with Dr. Lyons. Um, learned a whole lot from him, still do. Uh, and have been on a fairly long journey. My original bench research, when they told you to go to med school, you have to do something. I didn't know what that meant, but they pointed me to a lab. It was actually in mu receptor morphology changes from in vitro uh, opioid agonist exposure. And so, I know, but I think some of these people are tracking. Yeah, <laughs> Tom plays dumb, it's not true. Uh, and so started that journey in 2000, actually. Uh, and then many, many years later, it got kind of wrapped back into the issue, started with um, statistical evaluation for the National Association of Board of Pharmacy with the prescription drug monitoring programs, which were very early markers on how bad this was going to get, and here we are today. So unfortunately, that was a correct uh, epidemiologic analysis of what was going to happen. So today, I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Brightview, which is a multi-site, state-certified, comprehensive alcohol and drug treatment program, uh, sites all over this region. Uh, I'm also the chair of, uh, excuse me, the um, chapter president for the Ohio Society of Addiction Medicine, and I chair pair relations nationally for ASAM, which means I get to run around the country and talk about how we should get paid for these to take care of these complicated patients when the insurance companies don't necessarily agree. Um, and through that mechanism, end up doing a lot of state and federal kind of Medicaid, Medicare policy work, um, and work with Dr. Lyons and, Dr. and, and uh, Mr. Ingram uh, heavily on this region realizing that this, that, that public health is a huge part of this discussion and has to be, and we need to work all together because we're obviously not resolving it on our own, any of us. And so I think that that's why they asked me to come here today. And do I need to pass this around for answers or they're covered by the mics up there? Okay. 
So All right, thanks. So um, we'll start with some questions that were developed by the student um, group that organized the uh, Public Health Week and this event. Um, and the first few uh, address the challenges of kind of the repeat patients and the relapse rates. Um, so Dr. Lyons, the first question is for you. Uh, what are the challenges of treating opioid addicted patients in the emergency department? And uh, can you tell us about the percentages of overdose patients that you see return for repeat overdoses? Great, thanks. So I, I found those to be really good questions and ones that I could talk about for hours and hours. So I, I did do some prepared remarks here just to try to keep on track with the short time. Um, I would say that there's a, a number, quite a few barriers to dealing with this issue in the emergency department. And I'll list a couple specific items here in a minute. But first, we need to start just far more generally. The emergency department environment, as you probably know, if you've ever been in one, is a, a very often very busy, but more importantly, chaotic environment, right? There's nothing is scheduled. Every day is different. There's hundreds of different staff rotating through. And most of the time when you're seeing a patient, you're seeing them for the first time. Um, <clears throat> and that makes doing anything extra or even anything reliably very difficult. Uh, and that, and, and certainly complicated. And that is probably the barrier that's most frequently cited as to why emergency departments have trouble engaging, uh, you know, additionally on new problems beyond what they're already struggling with. But I actually think there's two considerations that are even more foundational than that. The first is uh, that in my perception, healthcare providers, certainly providers in emergency medicine, still view opioid addiction as more of a voluntary choice and a moral failing than they do as a disease process. You know, think this idea of why don't you just stop, why are you doing this to yourself, that, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that leads to a couple issues. One is uh, stigma, and stigma is a huge barrier that has real consequences. Um, it, it interferes with engaging the patients uh, in a therapeutic alliance, and it, it even makes them not want to come to the ED in the first place. Um, the other thing is that it, it leads providers to act differently than they would if they were viewing this as a, as a regular disease. Okay, for the most part, we accept that there's this chronic and relapsing nature to things like COPD and diabetes. We don't really grant that for addiction. Um, and blame the patient much more so. Um, we, we, for the most part, understand that for something like hypertension, intervening early is necessary to prevent later things like heart attacks and strokes and kidney disease. We don't really think a, a, as intensively about that um, with addiction. And for the most part, we aggressively treat patients who have a, a near life threat, say a heart attack, for other problems, but not so much for addiction. Um, <clears throat> The other consideration I'd offer is that we're not really structurally or, or sort of cognitively in the way we think about things uh, oriented to, to think about what happens to the patient before and after they come to the ED. It's much more of a slice of life perspective, but of course that's not really how it is, right? Patients did have a life before the ED and they will have a life after the ED, usually. So um, <clears throat> we're, we're um, you know, focused primarily, our primary mission is on acute stabilization and not definitive treatment. So it's, it's more about what do I need to do right now to get this patient out of here, not about what do I need to do to fix all of the problems that they, they present with. And, and even the way we sort of count the episode of care is as a visit, right, not as a patient with multiple visits. And we're not structurally prompted to, to really address those issues of, of what came before, what's going to come, come after. Um, and it's even, that's even exacerbated the fact that addiction care is largely outside of the normal healthcare system, or at least has been historically. So I, I promise you some more specific barriers. The, the first is that many people don't come to the ED, right? So you can't help them if they're not there. Um, we don't usually screen for opioid use disorders, and, and it is opioid use disorders, not just overdoses, right? The overdoses are fairly obvious, but it's, it's the person with the abscess that next month is going to have an overdose that's also the issue. We don't screen for suicidality in patients when they come to the OD, I mean, uh, come in with overdoses. So we sometimes do, but we generally assume that that was sort of an accidental thing, and that's probably not true. A large part of those are actually an intentional or near-intentional suicide attempts. Um, <clears throat> when we do become aware that someone has an opioid use disorder, we don't do very much about it. Pa and patients are often not really wanting help. And the training we get and the systems we have to refer people to care 
are, are often inefficient and flawed and they are sort of structured to depend on you remembering to do something or you taking action to do something. They're not really automated and prompting you and making it easy. Um, as far as the question about recidivism and repeat overdoses, I don't have precise numbers for you other than to say, yes, it happens. I've heard stories of four overdoses from one patient in 24 hours. Um, we've, we've heard stories of people overdosing, you know, 10 times and then actually getting help and getting better. And people 17 times and then dying on the 18th. So does, does, you know, it's a chronic disease. If you're still using, you're at risk for overdose. That's not too surprising. Um, I would point out that the recidivism isn't just for overdoses, though. People can come in with ankle sprains or heart infections or overdoses or abscesses or other things, or they can come in for reasons that are totally unrelated to their, their drug use. Um, but recidivism is common for other things, too. So if you look at, we, we think of, we have 90,000 patients, right? But it's really not. It's actually 40,000 patients that came, you know, a total of 90,000 times. But that's over a one-year time horizon. If you look at it over a 10-year time horizon, 90% of the people we've seen before. It's actually pretty rare to see a person that we've never seen before. And the ED is much more like a clinic than we would, we would want to admit. And we see people over and over for diabetes complications and COPD and other things. It's, it, we think of it as different for opioids and, and drug use, but that might be more a matter of stigma than it is actually a matter of rates of recidivism. In fact, for opioids, I suspect it's, it's probably a, a fair amount less than other disease processes because people are generally pretty young and they're not real happy about being there in the first place. So um, that, I would say that's a quick overview of an extremely complicated big topic. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Dr. Ryan, and it's um, addressing kind of the challenges of rehabilitation. We see reports that replace that um, indicate relapse rates after addiction treatment for opioid use are around 90%. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that and how rehabilitation programs should maybe um, adapt to address that? How long? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Three to five minutes. Three to five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll try to summarize uh, a lot of very complicated things in, in brief. We are not doing a good job, we, the global we of the you know, healthcare, the industry of addiction treatment, at treating the issues. We're also not good at admitting how bad we are at it. I'm, I'm globalizing that, right? So we've, we've, that segment of what should have been healthcare hasn't been, so it hasn't been monitored very well, and people don't either track such things or they lie about them. <coughs> No one told you how direct I am. I apologize, but this is the way it is. And so we're starting to get there where we're saying, what is a, re what is a relapse? As public health, it's all about definitions, right, mm -hmm. Mr. Ring? Uh, it's about definitions. If you don't yeah. define it correctly, you can't Always track it, monitor it. It's not a metric. It's an anecdote. So all that being said, we know that for opioid use disorder specifically, not for all SUD, I'm not going to go all the way down that chain, that yes, especially without medication-assisted treatment, the relapse rate for opioid use disorder is far north of 9-0, and probably more like 9-5, 9-7. Um, that is a horrendous problem, and we are all trying to address it, all of us here on this panel. Um, it's not that high for others, but I would go back to the comments Dr. Lyons made, which are very important, is that we know that if you define things accurately, relapse rates for other chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, COPD, are the same. So, uh, for, let me go back up. The same is for those who are on medication-assisted treatment. They're far higher for those that are not. So, when I sat down with 20-plus emergency physicians the other day and had a two-and-a-half-hour thrashing because they were not accepting of the conversation, uh, it was a great discussion at our, like, two hours and 23 minutes. We were all on a good page. But for the first minutes, it was very difficult. They said, well, if we start treating people, we're doing what we can in the emergency department again. The system is not designed. Dr. Lyons and myself are working on that, so are many other professionals in the country. What can the ED do? What should the emergency department do, et cetera? When I said, well, we need to do more than we're doing today. We are capable of providing some interventions, some treatment, some linkages, more than we're doing today, which in general in the United States is Narcan and good luck, right, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. And, and, I, and they said, well, if we start doing more, they'll keep showing up. I said, if we had that attitude towards our other chronic relapsing diseases, we would have no job. Right, Dr. Pancioli, our chair, would say, you guys can go home because we only have 12,000 patients if you won't see the ones that are relapsing in their chronic disease states. 
So that doesn't work. But it's based on stigma, misinformation, and that misinformation, and I would describe it as kind of willful <coughs> ignorance, and also lack of education. Our opioid education, other than the bench research I described when we were medical students, was an hour to three. We might have had some addiction discussion in psychiatry, but it wasn't as well supported in that kind of um, specialty at the time, I don't think, where I trained it wasn't. And so, you know, the relapse rates are way too high to answer your question. We know some of the methods to fix them, to help them, to improve them. The primary and best intervention we can take for opioid use disorder today is a form of FDA-approved medication-assisted treatment, period. Then we have a lot of other things we need to do a better job of. But just a, a single point of focus, it's not clear, is that. Um, and then in the, in the environment I practice, right view, it's a biopsychosocial model, which actually applies to all chronic diseases and really should across the board, by the way, but we're not doing that. We have a sick care, not a health care system. So that is how, you know, primarily we need to do a better job with the medication assisted treatment, and that is a very long conversation. But it needs to be in, associated with, and you need to have fine colleagues who are. Uh, multidisciplinarily approaching the biopsychosocial disease state of addiction. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Dr. Brown about comorbidities, and I know most of our audience is probably from the health professions, but maybe you can explain what that is, and then talk a little bit about the comorbidities that are seen along with um, opioid use disorder. Well, um, thank you for the nice setup. Um, yes, um, so, you know, I think sometimes opioid use disorder gets seen as this that that is the disease state. And if we just treat that, we've, we've got it figured out. Um, unfortunately, um, our patients, um, as with any addiction, um, have really complicated psychosocial stressors. Um, they have high prevalence of co-occurring psychiatric disorders, um, anywhere from adjustment depression through um, paranoid schizophrenia and everything in between. Um, they have family issues, they have child care issues, they have so many needs. Um, and so, you know, our approach, um, as are many treatment facilities, are you have to address the whole person. Um, if you just um, address um, and give somebody methadone or Suboxone, Vivitrol, um, but they have a co-occurring psychiatric illness that you're not adequately treating, I can predict that that person is going to be um, having, be more likely to have a relapse um, down the road. So, you know, I think it's really important to provide evidence-based treatment um, that integrates and addresses as much as you can, um, preferably in one spot, um, so that they can get coordinated care to address co-occurring psychiatric illness, um, uh, you know, their addiction, of course, but also provide them with some real um, help with support. If you've ever tried to interact with some of these sim systems, um, they are complicated. Um, they are really complicated. You know, getting food stamps is not easy. Um, and so if you have food insecurity and an addiction and you've got kids to feed, you've got you to try and tackle all of that. Otherwise, um, you can treat one element really well, but you're not going to have that lasting impact. Um, so it's hard. It needs lots of uh, players to come together and figure out how we can optimize that, but um, certainly need to think holistically about treating both mental health issues and addiction, but all the other stressors and life issues that come with addiction. So. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Mooney. Can you talk to us a little bit about some policy approaches that might help to reduce relapse rates um, for users and um, particularly those who have served prison or jail time? Sure. And thanks to the panelists. That was like, I felt like that just kept evolving and now it's landed <laughs> on me. So um, um, I, I, I guess taking this back a little bit and when I think about um, like going back to my work when I, so one of my other hats that I wore was serving as a case manager for re-entering offenders. And I started three months prior to men and women, frankly, leaving um, prison. And this was all in Kentucky. Um, so, you know, the challenges that we had to overcome was, well, they're going back into the same community where they use drugs and everybody they knew used drugs. Um, there's so many different ways to look at structural inequality you have to talk about things such as racism. We cannot just ignore the fact that the crack epidemic happened and what it did was led to mass incarceration. You have to start having 
these major conversations. And frankly, until we do that, we're never going to le level the playing field with just having, you know, everyday conversations with people on the street and in a community. So those kinds of things surfaced. Um, trauma. People had been exposed to trauma since, frankly, birth. Um, and then going back into those same environments. Poverty. All of these things Dr. Brown was talking about where you have to deal with things like food. And great, now you have a big felony checkbox on your job application. How are you supposed to gain employment? How do you become legitimate again? So that whole process, uh, me as a case manager, while I think I did a great job of serving as this re-entry coordinator, I would work with the re-entry coordinator in, in the prison. I would work with the substance abuse treatment program. Back in those days, it was long-term, largely, that people were going into your halfway houses and then into long-term residential. Um, you'd have to get people like JFS on. You'd have re-entry issues with children if you haven't been with your children because you've been incarcerated. Um, it's just, it's a mountain. It's a mountain of things that have to be overcome. And then the problem is identifying, well, what's the first thing we've got to do? What's the second thing? So I think having sobriety on the inside is one thing. But then going back into the community where that set forth a lot of this and really spawned off this sort of drug using pattern, um, we just pretend like, oh, everything is okay. You're fixed now. You've had nine months clean. You've been in a therapeutic community. You can talk about your feelings. And here you go. Good luck. That is really unrealistic. So I think to Chief's point earlier, like we are not going to incarcerate our way out of this. There's absolutely no way. Um, because basically that's just not going to do it. It's two totally separate paradigms. And you heard him talk about how that struggle to kind of move with the paradigm shift has really affected him as a law enforcement officer. That's not the hat that was created for law enforcement. So the criminal justice system as a whole is not really made and, and equipped to be uh, empathic toward people who are dealing with substance use disorders. So I think we see this with jails, we see it with prisons. Uh, but right now, I think jails are stuffed. You know, they're full of users. And to Chief's point again, what are we supposed to do with people who are actually doing the dealing? Um, really, that's maybe more of an appropriate place for people to go. But, you know, users are not going to necessarily get everything fixed and resolved. If they do go in and they get clean, there need to be resources on the inside, frankly, to help them address all of this. So I think that's one thing. Um, the other thing is we have to realize that toxic stress and trauma are part of people's lives. And the healthcare industry has, I mean, you guys have a full plate right now. This is really, frankly, the first time I think that we've had conversations where you've had an entire epidemic being housed in public health. I mean, we didn't really say that with meth. We didn't really say it with crack. I mean, it did intertwine and there was overlap, but largely we used a criminal justice lens. So I think this sort of shift to say this is healthcare, this is public health, um, really is kind of forcing a lot of different conversations and they're very unique to this current epidemic. Um, so, you know, having that and then also understanding what people do. So I remember doing, um, I did harm reduction education. I would go talk to a group of men in a prison and get out a wooden penis, we called him Woody, um, but this was our harm reduction tool. And we would demonstrate condom use. And, um, you know, hey, like this is, this is how you put on a condom. Uh, we did it with women who were incarcerated because they didn't know how to negotiate using a condom with a male partner. Uh, we talked about different ways. There are safer ways to have sex than others to reduce communicable disease and spreading disease. So we knew, my old boss used to say, and pardon the frankness on this one, when they get out, they want to get laid and they want to get loaded. Those two things, and if we can protect them or at least give them a toolkit in the back of their mind so when they get out and they find themselves in that kind of a situation, what are some tools that I can potentially throw out to help protect myself from disease? Um, we also know that Ohio and specifically this area is kind of this huge hub for human trafficking. It's a huge problem. Um, so uh, we have a lot of discussion right now around human trafficking. We're kind of beefing up our protocols in public health because we've actually seen this, some evidence of it perhaps in the syringe exchange services we're offering where people are coming and exchanging thousands of syringes. Well, you know one person is not using 1,500 syringes. They're exchanging for a family or a community of users. So a lot of times it isn't a necessarily a choice that someone just says one day I want to use heroin. Sometimes they're introduced to it. Sometimes they're forced to use it. You never know what the situation people come from. So I would say having that, reducing the stigma through this conversation, but let's get real. Let's call things out on the table like they are. This is an unfair kind of epidemic. Historically speaking, we have not behaved so well as far as how we have addressed this, but 
we know better now, we're supposed to be doing better, and you've got lots of different partners at the table, which is pretty amazing. In the past, I can't say that that's happened. Thank you. Uh, Chief Sinan, the next question is for you, and you touched a little bit on this in your keynote, but um, why do you think that penalties for drug dealing in the U.S. have not really had the impact on stopping the opioid epidemic? Like I said, I touched a little bit on it. it one is, is like Dr. Mooney said, who, who are we punishing and what is that punishment supposed to be if it's that addicted person and somehow we think that putting them in jail for 30, 60, 90 days, a year or two years is somehow going to punish that addiction out of them. It's not. So again, we have to have that discussion who should be in jail and who should not be in jail. The overcrowded jail is just like the hospital system, just like the treatment system. Every part of the system is so overwhelmed with this, and this is the significant part with this. I don't think we would have seen a shift in drugs and what Dr. Mooney and everyone's been talking about if not for the numbers, if not for 50 to 70 overdoses a, a week, if not for 64,000 Americans dying. So it's, it's become a real problem within law enforcement. What do we do? And law enforcement right now is at a crossroads. There's contention. Because as much as I will go on this side and say that we need pre-arrest diversion, we need to think about it, there's others in law enforcement who disagree and who say it's traditional. You broke the law, you go to jail. No matter what we do, we're sticking these people in jail. And right now, all of you said the same thing, is where we're stuck right now is if you're addicted, we're trying to change this, but in general, you have two choices, go to jail or die. We've got to figure out how we can do a better job of connecting this so that those aren't the choices. So the jail system is so overcrowded, and when you're talking about the drug dealer themselves, like I said, for me, this was pretty simple. Two years ago, I wrote a letter to state legislators, need to increase the penalties. If you're dealing fentanyl or car fentanyl, then you know this is dangerous and you know someone could die. And the pushback was, how do you know, yeah, that, that dealer in the cartel knows that, mm -hmm. but how do you know when it's broken down to that dealer, that dealer, that dealer, and then the 18-year-old kid on the sidewalk knows it's fentanyl. I was like, uh, okay. Because I was getting reports that the middleman was wearing gloves and masks so that they wouldn't mm -hmm. get infected. However, they weren't telling the 18 year old kid that. The 18 year old kid's just pushing it down on the street. So then it comes back again, who's the dealer and who's not the dealer? And then it comes down to social economic issues. That person from the pharmaceutical company that pushed it out there, billions of dollars made, is not going to face one single day of jail. Well, there's some people working on a lawsuit now. It's a significant lawsuit. So the punishment is, for them, do we take money away from them? But then again, the other punishment for the 18-year-old kid is that you sit in jail. But it comes down to where do they go and where's the space in jail? So that was a really long, circular answer that had no ending <laughs> <laughs> on purpose because I, I really don't know. That's one of the struggles we're facing right now is what do we do with the jail system? Where does law enforcement fit into this? And, and I've been very vocal about this being a medical condition, and trust me, I, I'm not doing this to push it, to take it, the burden off of law enforcement. Because if any part of the system gets bogged, it doesn't work. And guess where it comes back to? Down on the street in law enforcement. I think often we are looked at as the social um, connection to many issues, and I'm okay with that as long as we're the link and we're not the ones that are intended to solve all the issues because we don't have those tools and we don't have those skills. So uh, that was a really tough question. When I read it last night, I'm like, I have no answer. I'm going to go on. I'm going with that. <laughs> <laughs> that was very good. Uh, the last um, specific targeted question we have is for Commissioner Ingram. Um, in 2017, there was a Hamilton County Narcan distribution collaborative mm -hmm. to increase the supply um, can you tell us a little bit about this initiative, and is there anything you can share with us about an impact you've seen yet? Sure. Thank you. Um, so actually, uh, we have most of the partners, actually all the partners are here at the table. Um, so the Narcan Distribution Collaborative, um, I, I always uh, want to first recognize and tip my hat to Dr. Sean Ryan for actually making this possible along with um, uh, Dr. Lyons and our friends at the city um, and all the hospital systems actually uh, uh, chipped in too, along with uh, our health foundation and Town Interact for Health. So there was a question, and it's a research question, and it's a question that is actually uh, under evaluation. And that is if we saturate um, in as many places as possible uh, the, uh, the, uh, the availability of Narcan and do training, uh, will we reduce the number of overdose deaths? And so that project, that project actually kicked off in October of um, 2017, and actually the, 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 one of our primary partners not only was the Brightview Foundation, but Adapt Pharma, the makers of Narcan, which is, you know, generically known as uh, naloxone. And so they had committed to 25,000 doses uh, per year, over two years, over two years, 
Uh, and if you think about it, if you look at the retail value of that, that's a pretty large donation by, uh, by a company that approaches probably a couple million dollars, I'm not counting uh, in-kind services from the folks here at the table as well as the monies that we raised from um, a variety of healthcare foundations and hospital foundations. So we began doing that in October. And if you look at when we started in October through the end of March, we've actually put 8,568 doses on the street, um, predominantly in the hands of uh, first responders, but also in the Justice Center. We're down at the Justice Center um, every week um, and uh, offering uh, doses of Narcan there um, to folks. And also we have um, a harm reduction program. Uh, we call it the Exchange Project. But I couldn't come here um, as a public health guy and not bring data, okay? <laughs> I mean, we're all talking about data. So I brought some data with me, so if you'll just bear with me. I got a few slides, four slides, and I just wanted to actually put this kind of in context because Chief Sinan talked about the magnitude of the issue and everything, and everybody's working so hard. Um, and there are, and this really is a, uh, a full court press, to use a good basketball analogy. There's really a lot of people working from different sides of this, not only just on the supply control, but also on um, the uh, uh, educational side, prevention side, harm reduction, as well as the treatment side. Um, and so if you look at this slide, this is actually just came out yesterday. And so this is um, uh, the uh, monthly uh, report for March looking at the number of overdoses uh, that have occurred in Hamilton County. This is just Hamilton County specific data. And if you look at the red bar, uh, the red bar is actually the number of people that presented at an emergency department that Dr. Lyons spoke uh, about who uh, was, was um, complaining or had uh, exhibited an overdose. And so um, if you look at the blue bar on, on that graph, that's the number of 911 dispatches. And of course, the little green on the tip, which is ultimately the ultimate, um, what we're truly trying to uh, prevent and stop here in Hampton County, and that's the number of deaths due to opiate overdoses. And as you probably heard, 2017, uh, unfortunately, is going to go down um, probably as the worst year, and I hope it's the worst year, because I actually agree with Chief Sinan, and I've been saying it too, that I think we're going to pivot this year, okay? Um, and it's too early to make any, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, comments or about what we're seeing on those bars, but you can see the data. Um, just remember, in 2017, there was almost 4,000 individuals that presented at one of the 11 emergency departments in Hampton County um, who had overdosed on, uh, on uh, uh, opiates. Now, some of those were the same individual, but uh, that's a lot, of, uh, a lot of resources being consumed um, uh, of the emergency departments. If you put this, and this is 2017 data, and so we talked, uh, I've heard Chief Sinan talk about lower price sale, which you can see that's uh, right next to the, to the city there, but you can see this is just not uh, a Cincinnati uh, con problem. It's obviously, it's an, it's an Loveland area. It's an Anderson Township. It's in Coleraine. It's in Cheviot. It's, you know, it's all over. The redder the color, the more overdoses. And this is where people, this is the, uh, the zip code that they, uh, they, dis they um, pr presented at when they were registered um, uh, at the emergency department. So it's, it's a very pervasive problem. And if we had, if we brought in data from Butler County, uh, Warren County, uh, Claremont County, and even going further east out in Adams County, you would see similar. It's just a function of the magnitude. Obviously, we have some issues going on here because we are a hub, uh, as Chief Sinan said, but there's also it's a function of the population. I just wanted to say the other thing that we have instituted, um, and it's become a public health program, and we transferred it from the UC College of Medicine, and that is uh, what we call the Exchange Project, and I like to refer to it as a harm reduction program. And um, Dr. Brown talked about, you know, the secondary infections. We know that the injectable drug use population um, is highly at risk for HIV and hepatitis. As a matter of fact, we're very concerned uh, working with our colleagues from this, uh, with Dr. Mooney and Dr. Crumpton and others at the city, um, as well as um, uh, the folks here at the College of Medicine. Um, we're very concerned that um, that we're starting to see a change, and well, we have seen a change in the number of HIV cases for the first time uh, from when comparing 2016 to 2017 data, we actually saw a 38% increase. And when we look at the risk factors, and there's three primary risk factors, one of them is injectable drug use, we saw uh, an increase in a number of, of, uh, of uh, about almost doubling of, of the number of cases of new HIV due to, uh, due to this uh, uh, people using drugs and sharing equipment. 
You're also seeing the same thing on Northern Kentucky. As a matter of fact, we have actually brought in CDC uh, as a part of this uh, investigation, and we're going to think we're going we're to we're going to do some cluster analysis to see if there's a common point source on this. And that work's just starting. So that's what we're putting on uh, on this van right here. That's uh, that van uh, uh, is where we do the harm reduction program. It's where we exchange syringes. It's where we do counseling. It's where we do referrals and a treatment. It's where we do uh, preliminary testing for HIV and hepatitis. Um, it's where we also distribute condoms. It's also where uh, we uh, make sure that people feel that there is um, there is a there is a uh, home for them, if you will. Uh, that uh, because the staff on there are very caring and compassionate, we meet people where they are, um, and we try to help them get better. And that's uh, that van's now operating uh, four four full days a week. About to move to a fifth site. Um, and um, three neighborhoods in Cincinnati, one, in, uh, one half a day out at Claremont Mercy and Batavia, Ohio, and another uh, half a day up in Middletown. And so there's a lot of work going on. And just last week, we exchanged our 100,000th syringe since January 3rd. Now think about that. 100,000 syringes just got exchanged in really three months' time, and that represents about 2,300 clients that have now utilized our services. Um, and we've been seeing about a 10% growth in new clients. We have really good data on this um, because you'd expect that we're public health. And so that's all I really have. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I have a couple other questions here, but I know like our time's going to go quickly. So I think what I'll do is open it up to you all to ask questions, and then I'll kind of wrap things up with maybe one or two of my final questions. Yes. I'd like to thank the panelists. What you're doing is very, very I represent a segment of people that you probably wouldn't recognize. We raise taxes. We are elected officials. We have to go and knock on doors. I'm on the executive committee of the Regional Council of Governments. This is not just my experience, it's the experience of others. We don't mind when we knock on doors of voters that the voters want to deal with this issue. They don't want to think about this issue. And because they don't, it's frustrating to those of us that teach public health who have real students to get students agitated about this and then say, but I can't give you a constituency. So my message is work <coughs> as closely as you can with the inquirer, with the TV channels, with the radio, with other people. Get it into social media like next door. Get the message out to constituencies. This matters. This is important. If you do that, then you're my backup. And the next time I knock on doors for re-election, people will say, yeah, that's something we ought to do. We ought to do more Queen City Treatment Center at Correctional Institute beds and not just the, the viaduct. That's an important choice. People need to be the constituents who tell me who raise taxes what we want their taxes spent for. Thank you. Yeah, uh, religion and spirituality can be great positive and negative motivators. Uh, how can members of the faith community actually partner with with your organizations so that they can be a positive influence? I, I will just venture out and say, I mean, this kind of goes into something else I, I constantly say. We have a lot of people who always want to volunteer. They want to volunteer on the van. They want to volunteer and do this. But a lot of times you feel like, well, we don't want to sort of exploit people who are um, suffering, frankly. And um, I think that, frankly, the biggest thing is if you can do this with the faith-based community, with any community, um, LGBTQ community is huge, um, you know, people of color, whatever. But I really think that what needs to happen, and this would be the easiest, co most cost-effective, and mark my words, get an economist in here, it will be a great return on investment because we need foot soldiers, frankly. We need people going into communities. I mean, we can do this. We can have panel presentations. We can... You know, Chief Sinan is like on TV like every day, and we can do this all day long. I look but, taller on TV, so you know. <laughs> but I think like we need people who are informed enough about, you know, communicable disease, and, and that this is really an amazing program because what it does is it knocks down that wall of stigma, too. It creates a system of accountability. You've got 2,000 people who keep coming back. And it's not to protect themselves because most of them are already known positives. Most of them already have hepatitis or HIV. So they're protecting someone else. And you know, if it's in, if it's in a way for them to exchange 
and get um, clean, sterile syringes, and we're removing those from the streets. Essentially, they're not being left on park benches and those kinds of things. To me, that's a great message to spread because that not in my backyard kind of thing is what we hear all day long is, oh, this doesn't affect me. Well, if you pay taxes, it affects you. As a taxpayer, you just don't know what you're paying for. You're paying for the exorbitant health care costs of people using the emergency room versus going to a health center. Um, the fact that we're treating hepatitis and HIV in people who are uninsured versus preventing it. So I think that that information, I mean, as public health folks, this is the kind of stuff I love. Say, here's some information. If you feel passionate about this, go door knocking. Spread this good word and explain to people this does affect you, and it'd be great to get involved rather than pretend it doesn't exist. So I think that's great. If, if you have folks that want to do that, then I think not one of us would turn down the offer to say, here's some education. Go out and just talk to people. You know, have conversations with families who are affected by this. And, I mean, my family alone, I've lost an aunt and a cousin but in the past couple of years. Um, both of them were heroin users. One came out of prison from stealing her granddaughter's prescription drugs and uh, went in, was successful in a halfway house, relapsed, died, because she went back to using the same amount of drugs she did before. My cousin was found in a hotel room. My husband, Middle Eastern man, totally different ethnicity, totally, we lived on the other side of the planet, and his cousin just died uh, a couple of years ago from fentanyl overdose. So this is in everybody's house, um, whether you like it or not. I think that the awareness is very, very possible um, if we just have enough people out there who want to spread the, spread the word, you know? So. Doc just, just awesome. a couple of things. So I want to connect what you're asking what he was talking about and then one other issue. So I would say that one of the ways to get the public to understand is through the faith-based community. So if the congregations are willing to talk about it, have members of the congregation come up and say, which is tough, right? You're probably going to get 10% buy-in on that at best. There's still another 90% of the congregation who know their uncle, cousin, whatever else, and they're still not going to come forward. But any amount of information, destigmatization, and conversation that can occur in those congregations is huge. Because it'll help him, it'll help us, for sure, getting those people, that family members coming forth earlier, getting treatment earlier, all those things are important. But I think that the faith-based community can have a huge impact on the destigmatization and discussion mm -hmm. because there's some belief in something there. There's one other big issue that's not necessarily discussed. So why, why, do, why do NAAA, Smart Recovery, those kind of, why does, that, why does that work? Why does it have a place? So one of the things I can't do, and Dr. Brown can't do, is actually fix some parts of that human that are human connection. So she does probably more than I do. I don't actually have a medication that does that, by the way. We've looked at this extensively. And in the chain of things that we can affect, that is the least. And so peer recovery, support stuff, connecting, if it's through faith for that individual, is huge. It repairs things I can't, she may have less effect on, and at the, it's at the end of the chain. I'm not going to get into the details necessarily. But it is important, and people think it's, they don't know exactly, a lot of people don't know why that's the case but there are neurobiologic restorative things that occur with human connection that needs to happen. And a lot of people can, and especially if that congregation, that faith community is accepting, will find that peer connection that is necessary in that community. Um, yes, so different treatment facilities have different models for this. Um, you know, we have sort of a tiered approach to treatment, so I always tell my patients, I look forward to the day you put me out of business because that means you're doing really well and you don't need to see me every week and we have nothing to talk about. That is a good thing. Um, but until that point, we're going we're gonna to be as comprehensive as we can. Um, and so peers and people that have been successful in their treatment can be really helpful in that regard. Um, one of my colleagues has a study right now that's testing that very concept. Can we um, incorporate peer-driven communication with people that have been successful in treatment to help connect people who aren't engaged to treatment and help their long-term outcomes? So there's definitely, um, you know, what flavor of peers and how that looks. Um, but, you know, to Dr. Ryan's point, you know, having that peer connection, having that um, connection so important. Oftentimes when people get to our doors, a lot of bird bridges have been burnt with relationships. Um, they've burnt through family, they've burnt through friends, um, and they don't have, you know, like everybody they're with is using. Um, and so 
to have some support of people that aren't using is huge, um, and having that available. Um, and exactly how that looks, I'm not sure, but it certainly can't hurt, right? Um, and so finding ways to make that possible and fit within a treatment program I think is really important. One other, we've instituted a, a kind of on admission peer recovery connection that actually made more impact on our retention than anything else I did, which surprised me, to be honest. Like I, I, I the peer recovery training and stuff and reimbursement for that and everything connected to that in the state of Ohio is advancing. It's not a new thing, by the way. It was a kind of national analysis. Ohio was a little behind on that, far ahead on other things. And so we have seen in a kind of small test of change a phenomenal rate of retention on that day one, day two, kind of very early peer connection situation, which is different than the thing I was describing about long-term human connection, restorative stuff, uh, but it is a very important thing. Uh, as Dr. Brown said, it's a balance, though, because, again, the industry has historically abused that, where they've taken somebody who's 90 days in the recovery and said, hey, you're good. Can you help this guy out? Ooh, probably not the right perspective. Okay. One other thing on the peers, um, and going back to what Chief was mentioning, and he said he, we weren't going to talk about it today, so I'll bring it up, um, <laughs> is the uh, quick response teams. And these quick response teams, frankly, there are a lot of different models, but essentially the idea is someone overdoses. You have, remember, this sort of interdisciplinary team now. You've got first responders from fire, you've got police, and you've got your treatment entities. And they, as a team, basically go door knocking. And they say, hey, we heard somebody in this house needs some help. We're here to help if you need it today. Um, the problem is with that particular model is there's a lot of money on the street. That's a very costly program to run when a lot of the doors are not getting opened. So um, Claremont County, for example, uses peers and they have a very, uh, frankly, I think it's a great model because it's cost effective. I think peers are, are required because it's a two-way street. It helps facilitate their own recovery. They're gonna, they get to pay it forward and it keeps them on the straight and narrow. And yet what it does is it creates buy-in for someone who says, you don't know me because you've never walked a day in my shoes. So they're using that for quick response teams, and I think they're having great success. They're using two peers and one paramedic. So in case of an overdose, that would make sense. But essentially to get someone to open the door by saying, hey, I've been in your shoes. Like, I know what you're going through. I can take you somewhere today mm -hmm. if you are ready. And it, it might just have a different spin. So. And, and I think the cat house is using some of that. We use peer navigators and peer mentors with Dominique. Um, they actually came out to her house. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's people that are trying to do it, and you know the doctors obviously make a, a valid point. <coughs> What's that step? And there's mm -hmm. got to be some training with that. Um, we actually looked at from the coalition, could we get people to be volunteer? And it was quickly like, no, there's, there's psychology, there's addiction to this. Mm -hmm. You can't just have anyone do it. So when we talk about volunteers, a lot of times we say go out and talk to people, and I think people discount that. Um, but that's extremely important because mm -hmm. I sit here and I'll say that 64,000 Americans died. You know what my expectation to get back is? A lot of gasp and people going, let's go fight right now, let's do something. And it never happens. So it's not the numbers that do it. What's going to end up doing it is those conversations in the churches, in the schools, in the homes, mm -hmm. in, in the communities that actually get people together and the peer mentors telling their stories. Because those peer mentors, the other good thing about them, they're an inspiration. They inspire not just the people that are using, but they inspire us that there is hope and that there is recovery with it. So I think it's a very valid point. And Dr. Mooney's been really pushing this to get the peer mentors part of this system and connecting to it. So I buy in completely. Yep. Um, so of the 64,000 people who have died, how is the foster care system now holding up and the social services system holding up to these children left mm -hmm. behind by all these deaths? It's not. It's not. I mean, ab absolutely not. And we have no idea. My original bench research, 20, almost 20 years ago, demonstrated we had permanent changes in the receptors for those NAS babies, which are an effect, right? There's a ton of that. Mm -hmm. Children just released a study. We know there's a developmental delay. It's the two to three year mark. We don't, I don't know, Dr. Brown was, well, I don't know what's going to be going on in the next five to 10 years because you've got complicated, Eight overwhelming years. a number of, of those young people who are, have already had substantial trauma. Mm -hmm. I would say, the, the, the super optimist in me hopes they have some sort of, def, you know, anti-opioid defense gene. Yeah. It probably didn't happen, though, right? Mm -hmm. right. There's too many a aces in their life already to start that way, and foster kid system can't maintain them. It's mm -hmm. not like it was killing it in the first place, right? It's not like we had this amazing foster system that was supporting everything optimally to begin with. Now overwhelmed, multiplied by all the things I just talked about, I have substantial concerns mm -hmm. with, with that issue in the next 10 to 20 years of, kind of ongoing effect, even if we do turn the corner in this region in this year for opioid deaths. 
the kids that issue. are the kids that are currently in the system. I talked to a colleague. I said, "Look, I need you to download your brain. I need to know what's going on in JFS." And and she said, "Okay, how long do you have?" Like, it's it's already undernourished, like Dr. Ryan's saying. But what they're doing is because there are not enough placements for foster care. So a kid who may live in Hamilton County might get bused to Claremont County, might go to Kentucky to be placed in a foster care system. And if you think about the whole social world of a child, drug addiction exposure in a family setting might be one thing, but if he had a, grand, a grandmother or an aunt, but they were elderly and they can't take in a foster child, he is no longer well, associated with those people who could be positive. He, he's no longer associated with peers that are in school that could be positive or just being connected to a school or a church. Any of those other positive influences in life are gone the second a kid is bussed out to another county. So that's how in inundated they are with that right now. So do you know of any type of programming that targets that generation and those kids who their whole entire world has been disrupted, not only did mom or dad die or they can't take care of them, but now they're, they're being moved, they can't meet their base, you know, school's being affected, social life's being affected, all of that's being affected. I've done a lot of research, I haven't seen any kind of program that targets that generation. I think there's some initial um, work that's being happening locally. Um, you know, collaborators over at Children's are, are doing some of that work, but um, there's just so much that needs to be done in that arena. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, we're often seeing intergenerational opioid use. Um, so it's not just mom, but mom and grandma. Um, are both using, and so um, you know it's just such a complicated issue and so many needs. So uh, lots needed.